Go ahead and take a seat. As you're doing so, take your Bibles, your apps, whatever you read on, and turn to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. If you don't have a Bible or you don't have the Bible app on your device, um, ever few chairs, there's a little rack underneath the chair, and and we've got Bibles there available for you. Feel free to grab one. Uh, If you don't have a Bible at home, uh, I want you to take that Bible from underneath that chair, and at the end of the service, tuck it under your arm and walk out the door with it today, because we want everybody to have a Bible at their home that they can study, they can reference, they can read. Uh, So feel free. Let that be our gift to you today. Um, We want you to have that, so take that with you if you need that. Um, So Galatians chapter 5. Um, I went to seminary several years ago. Now, seminary is master's degree study for preachers. Um, And if I would have known at the time what the workload was at seminary, I don't know that I would have went. It was ridiculous. The papers, the reading, uh, all the stuff that was required, I don't know that I would have made that commitment. But I very distinctly remember it was my very first semester at seminary. I uh, was working on a paper, it was like five weeks into seminary, so about a third of the way through the semester, and I had a 20-page paper due the next morning. I'd been working on this paper for a little bit over three weeks, and I still wasn't done with it. Um, And so I'm feverishly at my desk, typing away, trying to get this thing finished, and it was like 10 o'clock at night. And Jana walks in, my wife, and she says, are you anywhere near being done? I said, no, this, this is going to be an all-nighter. And she goes, okay, well, let me brew you a pot of coffee. At the time, I was not a coffee drinker. Notice past tense, I was not a coffee drinker. And so I thought, how much could a pot of coffee help me stay up overnight to write this paper? So she made the pot of coffee, poured me a cup, and fruit fruit it up um, because at the time I didn't drink coffee. Now, now I'm a manly man. I drink my coffee black. Um, no lie, that's how I drink my coffee. But, but at the time, since I wasn't used to it, she put things in it to make it taste better. And so she comes in and she sets the coffee on my desk as I'm doing this. And um, she says, good night and goes to bed. And so I start drinking this cup of coffee, and like 30 minutes later, I'm like, this is amazing, ah! and I'm just <laughs> typing away feverishly, like the, the words are just flying through the page because ah! I was acting like an addict in the moment, <laughs> and so I finished the paper. I'm pretty sure I made a good grade on it, but it was in that moment that I had a light bulb instant. You, have you ever, remember any of those old cartoons where the cartoon character would suddenly realize something and a light bulb would appear of his head and turn on? I had one of those moments. I realized at that time, in that evening, drinking that pot of coffee, it dawned on me that the key to passing a master's degree is coffee. <laughs> it totally is. I don't know that I would have made it through seminary if it wasn't for that beautiful bean juice. (laughs) But in the moment, I had that, oh, this is what I can do to help me. It was that, oh, light bulb clicked on. Have you ever had a light bulb moment? Yeah. We've all had those moments. If you've ever taught a child how to ride a bicycle, you've seen the light bulb moment go on because there's a moment where you've struggled with your child to teach them to pedal and pedal and pedal and they just haven't really gotten it. And there's that moment where finally the seventh time you let go that they pedal and they suddenly realize if I pedal, the bike stays upright. And they have this aha moment and from that point forward, their ability to ride a bike just exponentially goes up, right? It's those light bulb moments that really can help us in a lot of different ways in our lives. And that's what our new sermon series is about. We're starting a new series today called Character 101. And we want you to understand that there's this concept that if you had an aha moment, if you had that light bulb moment with what we're studying over the next nine weeks, that your walk with Christ could be revolutionized. It could be changed dramatically for the better. It would be that light bulb moment in your life where you went, oh, 
if I can do this, I can walk with Christ better. And so that's what we're going to be studying for the next nine weeks, and it's found in Galatians 5. So take your Bibles. I told you to turn to Galatians 5. We're going to start in verse 16. Verse 16. And we're going to be studying for the next nine weeks the fruit of the Spirit. If you've been in church any amount of time, you've probably heard of this, but we're going to talk about it uh, for the next nine weeks and study it in depth. So look with me at Galatians 5, starting in verse 16. It says this, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these two are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Okay, stop there for just a second. Can any of us identify with that last little statement of verse 17? to keep you from doing the things you want to do. How many of us know there are things that we want to do and we just don't get around to doing it, right? How many of us in this room have made that New Year's resolution, you know what, I'm going to start working out, I'm going to get fit, I'm going to look good, and we go and buy a gym membership and we use it for a week and then it doesn't get used for the next 12 months, right? That's what we do. You know what, I'm going to start eating better. And then you go to the restaurant and you go, oh, but they've got this apple pie and there's fried this. And, you know, we just don't do the things we want to do. We don't do the things that we know will improve us and make us better. And that's not just in a spiritual sense. That's across the board, isn't it? We as people, we as humans struggle to do the things that will make us better. Have you ever heard that it's, takes like three days to break a good habit, but it takes like three months to build a good habit back in. There's a lot of truth in that, isn't there? So the fact is, is that this passage is addressing that very thing. And it talks about, I want you to notice the language it's using here. It talks about the desires of the flesh. In other words, the way sin has messed us up. That's the desires of the flesh. And then it's got the desires of the spirit. And it says that the two are opposed to each other and they're constantly fighting against each other inside of us. In other words, we know the right thing to do. We know the good thing to do. But the desires of the flesh pull us away from doing the good things, from doing the right things. And so we struggle. I mean, think about it. Procrastination is the definition of what we're talking about here and every single one of us in this room procrastinate. So let's keep reading. Verse 18, that's where we're at. Verse 18, but if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now stop there. I want you to notice the phrasing here as well. Being led by the Spirit. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't generally start following something unless I intentionally think about following something. In other words, following Being led by the Spirit is an intentional act. Our default is to do the works of the flesh, to to do the desires of the flesh. That's where we automatically kind of fall to as people. Uh, I mean, think about it. We are not good people, are we? Innately, in our core, we are horrible, evil, bad people. And if you think otherwise, you have not raised children. I have a seven-year-old son at home, and did I teach my son to lie? No. Does my son know how to lie? Yup. I have never in my adult life thrown a temper tantrum. Does my son know how to throw a temper tantrum? He did until I beat that out of him, but I'm joking, kind of. The, the fact of the matter is, is... Our default, we are wired to sin. We're wired to do the thing we shouldn't do. And so to be led by the Spirit has to be an intentional process of doing what we're not wired naturally to do. Let's keep reading. We're in verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident. (gasps) 
Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the things like these. That is a long list, right? And he goes on to say, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But, did you catch that? But, in other words, the writer of this book, Paul, is saying, hold on, I just gave you a list of really bad things that you want to avoid, and I'm about to give you the cure, the antidote to those things. So here we go, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. It's joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. So think about it for a second. If in your life, you and everyone around you began to love more, you began to joy more, you began to be more peaceful and patient and kind and good and faithful and gentle and be more self-controlled, would you and the people around you, would your lives be better? They absolutely would. But is this our default? No. We have to intentionally think about doing these things. These are the things we have to intentionally do rather than just, oh, I'm naturally a loving, joyful, peaceful, patient, blah, 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 blah person. I mean, look at the last one, self-control. How many of us in this room just have self-control nailed? None of us. It's so hard. There is a tub of ice cream in my freezer right now and I know ice cream is Chad's thing like our our lead pastor's thing but that tub of ice cream is a constant temptation because self-control even if in, in its most basic forms is difficult it's hard so we need to understand as followers of Christ that there are these desires of the flesh that we naturally kind of fall into and if we want to be Followers of Christ that are strong, that are brave, that are courageous, that are making a difference in this world, we have to pull away from the desires of the flesh and be led by the Spirit. Because once we step in line with the Spirit, the Spirit helps us with all of this fruit. The love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. I never can remember the order. Faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. If we step in line and begin to be led by the Spirit... He comes alongside and helps us here. So today, we're going to focus on the first one, which is love. But let me be totally honest with love. Love is a confusing thing, especially here in America, amongst people who speak English. And let me tell you why. I love In-N-Out Burgers. (laughs) Can anybody identify with me? A good double-double makes my day. I love In-N-Out Burgers. I also love snowboarding. Now, as I make those two statements, there are similarities there, but they're very different, aren't they? Let me make it a little more apparent. I love Calvary. I love this church, and it's not just because I work here. It's because I'm fully bought in. I believe in what this church stands for and the way it lives out God's word and the mission of Jesus Christ. I love this church, but is my love for Calvary anywhere even close to the love of In-N-Out Burgers or snowboarding? No, they're completely different ideas, aren't they? Let me make it even more complicated. I mentioned I have a son, a seven-year-old son at home. His name is Knox. I love Knox, but is my love for Knox and my love for Calvary the same thing? No, they're different. They're very different. One more, my wife, Jana. I love Jana, absolutely love her. Is my love for Jana the same as it is even for Knox or for Calvary or for snowboarding or for in and out double doubles? No, oh God, it better not be. (laughs) Some of the couple, did he just really say that? That's a different sermon, it was two weeks ago, we talked about the bedroom, go online and watch it. But the fact is, is we have one term, one word in English that describes 
all of these feelings. One feelings that are very minuscule and kind of stupid. My love for In-N-Out burgers is not life-changing. Let's be honest. Uh, life-changing. Um, <laughs> but my love for my wife or my son or this church, those are life-changing feelings or emotions or actions. Yet we use the same word to describe both of those things, those, those multifaceted feelings. And so this is a confusing concept to us as Americans. Uh, it, it, let's just call it out for what it is. So what is love? That's the big question I think that we have to begin with and we have to answer. What is love? What does it mean? Well, I just gave you an example of all these different varieties. The, old, or the New Testament... You know, the book that we're reading from right now, Galatians, is in the New Testament. And the New Testament was written in the Greek language, okay? Our version that we have in front of us has been translated from Greek into English. Now, the Greeks had six different words for our one word of love. So let me go through those real quick. First one is romantic or sexual love. They had a word that was exclusive to that kind of love. They had a word for playful love. And this is really fascinating. This is interesting. I'm going to chase a rabbit for just a second. Their idea of playful love, they defined it as the love that you feel at the beginning of a romantic relationship. They believed, and I think they're totally true on this, they believed that the love you feel at the beginning of a romantic relationship is totally different than the love you feel in a mature relationship, in a, church that, uh, in a relationship that has matured over time. Because let's be honest, my love for Jana 14 years ago when we started dating has matured and is completely different today than it was then, which is the third kind of love in the Greek uh, language. It's a long-lasting love. So they had romantic love, they had playful love, like that beginning relationship type love, and then they had a love that they described as when a husband and wife are together for a long period of time, it becomes this different kind of love. Then they had friendship love. And I would never say this in public, but there are some of my buddies, some of my guy friends that I love. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> but the fact is, is it's a you know, girly, cushy, cushy word, but the fact is, is there are guys that I would give my shirt for. There are people in my life that I would, if they needed me, I'd be in my car driving to Texas right now. Like I would drop all of you people for this one friend. Now, I'm, maybe I would. But the fact is, is there is that friendship, love, that connection that we have with friends that's very unique. The next one is self-love. That's the fifth one, self-love. So when you look in the mirror and you go, dang, I look good. That's self-love, okay? In the Bible, Jesus used that word for love when he talked about the Pharisees wanting all the accolades and wanting people to notice how spiritual and how wise they were. That's the word. That's selfish, self-absorbed type of love. That's what that means, which leads us into the sixth kind of love, and that is selfless, unconditional love. Now, if you've been in church, you may have heard the term agape love. Agape is the Greek word that is usually used for love in the New Testament. So when Jesus says, or when Galatians 5 says, or 1 Corinthians says, love, it's usually agape. This selfless, unconditional, no holds barred type of love. And that's the love that we're looking at today because that's the love in Galatians chapter 5. So, how do we define this? How does the Bible define agape love? Well, 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 8, gives us that description. And you've heard this passage if you've ever been to a wedding. It is the most quoted anything in marriage ceremonies in the United States today. And it says this, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, says, Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. So 
I don't know about you, but I don't see any happy, feel-good, emotional words in this description, do you? No, the biblical definition of love is first and foremost, at its core, love is an action. Love is action. Love is something we do, and the cool thing about the way God designed love is when we live out that love, there's an emotion that comes with it. Don't hear, mishear me. Love is an emotion, but at its core, at its primary, firsthand, it is an action before it's an emotion. And let me explain why I mean, what I mean by that. If I stood up here in front of you and I was just ecstatic, bouncing off the walls, happy about some news that I had received, I could hide that from you and it would not change how genuine my happiness is, right? Yeah. If I stood up here and I was sad and I was heart-wrenched and I was struggling inside because of some new, bad news I had received, I could hide that from you and it would not change how real or genuine my sadness is, correct? But if I look at my wife and I say, Jana, I love you, but I treat her like trash and I'm not patient or kind and I'm rude to her, is that love genuine? No. You see, love is mo so much more than an emotion. Love is an action that comes with an emotion. It's bigger than a shallow emotion. It's greater than a shallow emotion. It's action in the process of an emotion. So love actually defines who we are as followers of Christ. If you go read John 13, verse 35, Jesus himself says, my followers will be known by their love. And so Jesus gives us a measuring stick by which to measure whether someone is a follower of Christ or not. And that measuring stick is love. So if somebody came up to you and said, oh, is so-and-so a Christian? Do they follow Christ? The first question you should ask yourself is, well, do they love others? Because that's the way Jesus defined the starting point, identity of his followers. And so we, as followers of Christ, are supposed to be a people of love. Remember, agape love, unconditional, limitless, selfless, no holds barred love. That's what we're called to do. In other words, let me say it this way. Following Christ is not about how much Bible you can quote. Because believe me, I've known plenty of people in churches who could quote you chapter and verse and still treated people like trash. It's not head knowledge that makes us followers. It's our love because our lives have been changed by Christ. That's why he says that's the defining attribute of his followers is that we love others. It's not knowledge. It's not some spiritual gift that you have. You could speak prophecies uh, all day long, and if you don't have love, you're missing the point. And if you want proof of this, we read 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. Go read verses th 1 through 3, because that's exactly what verses 1 through 3 says. I can do all these things in Christ, but if I don't have love, I'm just a noisy symbol, a banging gong. So love is the defining attribute of a follower of Christ. In other words, love sees people as people, not people as problems. Love sees people as people, not people as problems. And let me explain what I mean by this. Our default, our fleshly desires, our sin desires, is to categorize people, isn't it? We want to put labels on people, and we want to define the people around us as this is me, this is us, and that's them, right? Don't we all do that to a certain extent? We do that. Uh, think about politics. We do it with politics constantly. Oh, well, they're a Democrat, right? But we've had those thoughts. Oh, well, they voted for so-and-so. And, and we categorize them as someone different because of politics. Or what about religion? Oh, well, they're Muslim. So, you know, they're them. They're those people over there. 
and we categorize them, and we don't necessarily go, oh, because they're in this category, I don't have to love them as much. But subconsciously, to a certain extent, in the back of our minds, we justify hating them or treating them differently because they're in a different category than we've put ourselves in. Does that make sense? In other words, we do a lot of us versus they on a subconscious level, and we justify our horrible treatment of people because we see them as theys, not as people. We see them as a problem because they don't agree with us. And so because we've categorized them as something different than us, we justify our horrible treatment of those people. And you say, well, I don't do that. People, I have seen your social media posts. Believe me, we do that. And if you, you go, oh, well, I don't do that, eh, maybe you do. Because I don't know about you, but I constantly have to ask myself, should I like this? Would liking this article be showing love? Or would it just be sharing my hateful opinion about this topic? So we have to constantly be on watch for those kinds of things. Let me talk about one that's you know, particularly relevant today, race. And let me step on my soapbox for just a minute. You may want to curl your toes back so I don't step on them too hard. But the fact of the matter is, if you are judging or treating someone differently because they are a different colored skin than you are, you could not be more of an antichrist and more unbiblical in the way you approach the people of this world. Christ never says it's okay to treat someone differently because they look different than you look. Yet, isn't our American culture kind of fixated on this right now? The fact of the matter is as a pastor, I can confidently stand up here and say that if you judge people differently because they look different than you or their skin is different or they come from a different part of the world than you, you messed up the gospel of Christ. You missed the point altogether. And so if you are doing that, that is the first form that you need to look, step back and go, I'm not loving people. I've clearly categorized someone and made an us versus them and I have now stopped God's agape love. I have stepped outside of that unconditional, selfless love. But we do that with all sorts of things, all sorts of categories. And so please, the point here is that love has to be the cure to our hate. Martin Luther King Jr. has an amazing quote about this. He says, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. When you see hate in the world around you and you fuel that with more hate, what happens? The hatred fire just grows. But when you see hate and you douse love on it, what happens? You put it out a little bit. The fact is, is that love is the counter to hate and we're never called to hate people. That is not on us. Christ tells us to love our enemies, to love our neighbors, to love everyone. By the way, the word that he uses when he says love your neighbors and love your enemies is agape. Your love for your enemies is an unconditional, unfiltered, selfless love. Now, this is all fine and dandy, but what if you struggle with this? What if you're sitting there going, that's great and all, but there's some people I really don't like. There's some people that, if I was honest with myself, I'd say that I probably hate them. If you were sitting in my office and you asked me, how do I love people that I can't stand? Here's what I would tell you. Live out 1 Corinthians 13 and live out Galatians 5. It's as simple as that. If you will begin to force yourself to be patient and kind and loving and not rude and not disrespectful and not resentful, if you will force yourself to begin the actions of living love out in the lives of the people around you or the people you see as theys, God's spirit comes alongside, and this is the cool part, God's spirit comes alongside of us and says, you know what, I've been waiting all day for you to make this step. And now that you've taken this step, I'm gonna come alongside you and I'm gonna skyrocket you into these fruit. 
I'm going to make you a person that loves. I'm going to come alongside you and exponentially give you the ability to live these things out. But we have to take that first step. We have to choose, as Galatians 5 says, we have to choose to be led. We have to choose to submit to God's spirit and say, I want to be a person that lives out the fruit. Because fruit is life-giving. Fruit is sustenance. Fruit is delicious. People want it. And so if we live out the fruit, people's lives around us will be changed. So here's my question for us this morning. Who do you need to love? Who have you not been loving that you need to change and begin to love again? Join me in prayer.